live on today's teens. This is Kimmy. I'm here to teach you about the new natural 90s look. So we're starting with our clothes. I'm wearing overalls and you can do corduroy ones like me or you can do like acid wash jeans but make sure one of them is folded down because you don't want to look like you're actually like working you know <laughs> as if. So you got the t-shirt on underneath it and if you want to go a little grunge because that's really in right now you can add a flannel shirt around tied around and definitely like hiking boots the brown ones but make sure they're clean and new from a store because you don't want to look like you're actually like hiking because you know it's the grunge look but you're not supposed to be like grunge you know so also accessories accessories are your friend y'all so choker of course <laughs> and some other necklaces if you want them and some bracelets and rings if you want them the big accessories are the ones for your hair you can use little clips clips are very cool right now you can do what i'm doing with your hair you can use special little clips you could do a headband you could do like two headbands or three headbands you could even do like little baby clips because they're super cute too or you can have one of those big claws and do like a messy french bun sticking out the top only just like don't let it be really messy because ew you know okay now any kind of look the most important thing of course is your hair and makeup now <clears throat> this is the 90s y'all and the 80s was like so last decade so that whole like red blush and blue eyeshadow so pretty <laughs> not we're not doing that anymore we're going for the new natural look so to do the new natural look i'm going to show you how i already put on a whole base coat of foundation and powder because not like i'm going to show up without any makeup I'm really <laughs> so you're going to cover your whole face like your whole face you don't want any like color differentiations you want to start out with a blank canvas completely so that you can cover it all up with your natural look okay and while i'm doing this i just want to tell you my great aunt beatrice she's on this like beanie baby kick oops she told me if i ever see one for less than 20 dollars anywhere i have to buy it especially if it has the tag she's saving them she says they're an investment she's already got 200 and 213 now with that one and she says that they just keep getting worth more and more and more money and so someday they're going to be worth like thousands of dollars so she's getting more and more she's trying to get every single one especially the limited editions which are really expensive right now y'all for a thing with like a tag on it okay so yeah but my uncle fred who's married to my great aunt beatrice he says that she would be way smarter she would just sell all the beanie babies she actually has for what they're actually worth right now and instead stock up on cans for y2k because like the apocalypse is coming you know all the computers they're going to go to zero and zero and then they're going to turn off and all the computers in the whole world are going to turn off and we're going to be stuck with like nothing but canned green beans like forever i don't like green beans oh my word <clears throat> okay now once you're done with your foundation and you've got a blank canvas to work on, you're going to want to do eyeshadow and some other stuff. And you can go dark if you want, but remember, natural, natural, natural. So it has to be natural colors, browns, oranges, creams, stuff like that. And then, of course, your mascara, whatever else you want. And then the lipstick, which, again, you can do like oranges or peaches or reds or a cool color is like burgundy like plum and that works because plum is is a natural thing you know it's like fall colors and stuff just totally natural and then of course the hair yeah we're all done with this whole like spray it tease it go all crazy look like a punk rocker thing y'all what we want now is sleek smooth touchable hair but still has full body and lots of wave to it. So one word, y'all, Pantene. You've all seen the commercial. You know, that lady who's like, don't hate me because I'm beautiful. It won't happen overnight, but it will happen. Like seriously, all these people who had fried hair from the 80s, they started using Pantene and now their hair's like super gorgeous. The commercial is like true. Or you can get on and like at Walmart or someplace, maybe other people with, you know, stores. Yeah, like whatever. Um, 
they have this stuff called mane and tail shampoo that they use it for horses and some people are like ooh it makes their manes and tails like really glossy and so we can do that and if you don't have that or you're like really poor you can use mayonnaise or oil or just like whatever makes your hair glossy glossy is the goal okay so if you don't have a bunch of accessories and you're wanting to go for that Cindy Crawford look where there's like volume and life to your hair, but you don't want to spray it a whole bunch. Remember, natural people, I'm going to teach you how to do it. So here's what you do. You're going to flip your hair over and you're going to brush it and then you're going to brush it underneath. And then when you flip it back, watch what happens. So you flip it over and you brush it and then you brush it underneath like this. Ow, my earring. And then you flip it back. Check it out. 90s hair. And, you know, you can flip it. Yeah, you're probably telling me. Now, wait a minute, though, because after, like, first or second period of class, your hair starts falling flat on your head and flat. <laughs> Nobody wants to look like that. So, all you have to do is just casually, while you're talking to people, just sort of flip your hair over to where the part's on the other side. And look at that. You've got all that height and volume again. So all throughout the day, as you're talking, you can just keep doing this, or you can do this, or you can do this. Your hair is your best accessory, girls. Let me just tell you. Okay, so that's all we have time for today. The millennium's coming, you know. So just to remind you, you want to go grunge without being actually grunge, and like messy bun without it actually being messy. But most of all, you want this natural totally natural look. Okay. Happy millennium, everybody. Are we like done? Did you like turn it off? Because I gotta go touch up my makeup. I don't think I'm wearing enough. Oh, that's so embarrassing. We should have to do this again. Okay. Huh. All right. What is the 90s now? That was all. <laughs> now, as has been mentioned before, of course, one little slice of someone's historical remembrance is not true history. But the really fun thing about talking to an individual person is getting that individual slice of history. How many of you worked on interviews this week? Look at all that. Oh, that's so exciting. How many of you are surprised at least something that they said? Fantastic. It's really exciting to hear from someone personally. One thing I wanted to mention, though, with this whole, like, natural look thing, some terms are relative. Okay, this is so rude. <laughs> that's nice. This is rude, too, but that's okay. Um, for example, if you talk to somebody in the 90s and they were like, oh, yeah, we did the natural look, and you're looking at them thinking, that's the most unnatural thing I've ever seen. You've got, like, three layers of paint on your face. But they're coming from the 80s where the hair was like this and people were in blue and stuff. So to them, it was actually natural because they were going with natural tones. So sometimes when you're interviewing someone and you hit on a word, ask what that word means. Like say, for example, you're talking to somebody about the 60s and they say something like prejudice. You could say, what, is, what, do you, what does that mean? What was prejudice like in the 60s? Because their definition of prejudice might be quite different than what the 2022 version that you hear so, so, for example, somebody says, oh, well, America used to be a Christian country. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean religious? Does that mean everybody was a follower of Jesus Christ? Does that mean people wore decent clothes? Does that mean, what does it mean? And so sometimes defining your terms when you're talking to these people gets deeper into who they are, what they think about, what they care about. It's really exciting. Interviews are so much fun because you get to kind of relive history with someone who is living history. <sighs> One other fun little thing before I get started on all this is that when y'all see people now who are as old as me or older, you may notice that they're kind of stuck in whatever decade was their decade, like when they were in high school or in college, particularly the girls. The guys, you know, a t-shirt's a t-shirt. But for the girls, your age is when you care you care about being pretty or you care about being liked or if you're in a clique, you know, with a lot of peer pressure, you care about what they all think about you and stuff. And it kind of gets sucked into your head what is good, bad, pretty, not pretty. Um, so you'll notice women who were teenagers or college in the 80s sometimes still have that hair that's all like super tight curls and a boof right here. They still have it. That's the 80s look still. If you meet somebody from now the 60s, they probably don't have a bouffant, but they may still wear their hair up. The 50s ladies is that tight, it's like curled, cut right here, and it's curled all around their head. 
So those the ladies that are in their 70s and 80s sometimes look like that. It's kind of neat. And, you know, some people might want to pick on and be like, oh, they're so old fashioned. That was cool when they were your age. And so someday people are going to be looking at you and be like, oh, you're so 24. Exhibit A. My senior picture. My hair. <laughs> It just, I was surprised because I was like, I know this about people. And then I looked at mine and I'm like, oh, I'm still doing it too. Well, there you go. So it's interesting when I put all this gunk on today to show you, it felt so normal. Just because it was normal when I was 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. So it's really quite fascinating how much culture, your culture affects how you think about things, even when you're not trying to. For example, um... That is why you need to be really, really careful what you stick in your head. The people that you listen to all the time. The things that you're watching on TV all the time. The kind of books that you're reading. Because the things that you're sticking in your head are feeding you with information. And if you don't purposefully, critically think about it, it just sort of soaks in and kind of sticks. And then you start thinking that Beanie Babies are worth a heap and lot of money. Which if you didn't know, by the way... It didn't happen. So there were people with thousands of dollars of beanie babies and yard sale. <laughs> right now. <laughs> so let's talk about the 90s. It is the last decade in the 20th century. This is our last one. After this, we're going to move on to a few other things before the end of class, which I'm excited about. But this is our last one to look at culture, look at this weird land we live in and all the awesome things about it. So here we go. For starters, one real quick. I got a mom picture for you, just so you know. It's from the 80s. That was awesome. That's Tate and Bree and Tessa's mom. All right, the 1990s. Great advances in the great new millennium. Overalls with only one thing on. Why? Don't ask me. There usually isn't a why. The population at this point was 250 million people. So we're getting closer to what things are now. The average wage, I put two different numbers here on purpose. This is significant. You remember up until this point, the wage changed based on your gender or your race. The 90s was this big switch over to your wage being based on your level of education. The 90s was a huge cultural shift because computers happened, technology happened, and the yuppies happened, the young urban professionals. So the young people growing up were learning computers. And if you knew computers, you could get a job and get a lot of money. And now suddenly they were the power. They were the power of our culture. So if you had only had a high school diploma, 26,000 was your average wage that you could expect. If you had a bachelor's degree, 39,000. Huge difference. So when I was in high school, it was like, I'm going to college. It wasn't even a, you didn't even think about it. Of course you need to go to college because that's what we do in the 90s. This is Saved by the Bell. If you don't know about them, if you want to know what the 90s was like, there they are. I could tell you about 15 things just on this picture, particularly, <laughs> this reminds me of high school. The guys would have spiked hair and they would color the very, very tips of it as if somebody had dipped them in like bleach. Why? I don't know. Okay, here we go. We need the lights. The beaver. The beaver was the grandfather or great grandfather to <laughs> the text. <laughs> So the young urban professionals, the professional people, the business people would have it hanging on their little belt clip and they looked super cool because they were technological. And they would go beep beep and they'd be like, oh, gotta check that. And they'd check it and be like, I gotta call the office. Because it would have this little message on it with a number and then they had to leave and go find a phone somewhere and call the people back. But that meant you were like, ooh, cool. These guys, oh. everything was digital in the 90s. Digital, 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 digital. So even your pets became digital, and then they died, and people actually got upset about that. I don't know. I wasn't into that. VHSs. So no streaming, no Netflix, no YouTube, none of that kind of stuff. So you had what was on TV. Remember, like, Saturday morning cartoons? What was on at the exact same time? Say you missed it. It was Friday night. You wanted a movie to watch. There was nothing on. So you would drive all the way over to the Blockbuster video. Mine was, ours was like 25 minutes away. And we'd walk through the store, thousands and thousands of videos. And you'd pick one that hopefully all of you wanted to watch. And then you'd pay like $4.25, even back then, to rent this video for one night. 
And then we go get a carton of ice cream and we come home and we eat ice cream and we hope the movie turned out to be interesting because if not, you expect what it to be paid. And you had to get it back the next day or you had to pay double. And we thought those would live forever. They were like, it's... We actually have a North Carolina. The mall, the place of all places for teenagers to go and hang out. Your mom would drop you off at the mall with your friends or you would go to the mall and you just wander around. Now, that may seem extremely boring, but we didn't have the internet and we didn't have Amazon. So think of all the times you get on Amazon and just look at stuff. We didn't have that. So you go to the mall and look at stuff and you wander around and you look at everybody else and you see what they're wearing and what you're wearing. And I don't know, it was weird, but we thought it was fun. Okay, see this new sleek look? The 80s are over. <laughs> so now there's still big hair, but it's just like really smooth. This was a show I do not recommend you ever watch it. These little tiny sunglasses were in, and also the sundress with a t-shirt underneath. That was a huge trend. Um, Hope is wearing my sundress from the 1990s with a t-shirt underneath. This is actually an ensemble from my college. So they went from the 80s dresses with the shoulder pads and the ruffles and the collars to trying to look cool and preppy. Um, so they got these polo shirts that were really in style, and we were like, ooh, wow, y'all actually look cool. Now, but notice we still got big hair going on. Something you should know, decades in the changing culture, it's not like when it goes from 1989 to 1990, the whole place goes chunk and it all switches. There's time through where it merges from one to the other. Kind of like the civil rights, it was kind of more like 65 to 75 instead of 60 to 70. So if you're ever studying something and somebody's like, oh, that was the 90s, Mrs. Stigman lied to me. This is my disclaimer. You can't sue me. The grunge look, which this just cracked me up so much because it was a cool thing. It was a very cool thing to put on flannel and maybe even have a hole in your jeans. That was like, oh, most of us didn't want holes in our jeans because like that made you look like you were poor and you couldn't afford new jeans. But bigger jeans, you know, all that kind of stuff with the, with the round boots. But notice all these people are like gorgeously clean and all their hair is perfect. So the idea of that being grungy is just really funny. Kelly Kapowski, she was in Saved by the Bell. Most of us girls wanted to be her or look like her or at least have her hair. So her hair went from being the poop and it got a little smoother and then this happened. There was a show, she was in it, she got a haircut and the whole of America went, ah! I don't know why, but it came probably the most famous haircut of all time. All the girls in the 90s were going out to get the Rachel haircut. Again, why? And I don't know. And you guys, you got to turn to the 90s was boy hair decade. So the vulnerable look. Oh, I'm so young and vulnerable. Sad, and my hair is doing like this. Now, you remember how I told you if you're watching a movie about a decade, that it tells you as much about the decade it's made in as it does about the history it's supposed to be? That Titanic movie that they made in the 90s, which I don't recommend you watching, he was in it, Leo Boy. So their costumes were gorgeous, right on 1930s, like beautiful, perfect, deserved an award, historically accurate costumes. But he had that hair and she had 90s makeup, like plastered. So it's funny to me because if you look at it, you expect it to be historically accurate. Well, the movie wanted to be famous in the 1990s, not in the 1930s. If you watch again the one from the 1950s that we watched that was really, really good, you don't see all that. 90s stuff going on. Hey. This is the guy I married. This is his senior picture. Look at the background. So people making jokes about the 90s backgrounds, they're not jokes. They're the real thing. <laughs> so this was another 90s thing. Geometric shapes were really big and solid colors. Don't know why. Let's go. First Google server storage rack was made out of Legos. So the Google people got started. They were hanging out, coming up with ideas and stuff, but I don't think they knew that they were going to take over the world. Wow. So if you got Legos and you got a few ideas, who knows what might happen. <clears throat> this thing happened. That was like rich kid kind of stuff. The slap bracelet, which was invented by a teacher. Like what teacher would invent something so annoying? I don't know, but maybe it kept them busy. Tickle Me Elmo. This was like the first doll that caused this huge horrifying craze where parents were beating each other up trying to get it. And I don't know why. He just, if you tickled him, he went hee hee, you know, and so everybody wanted it for Christmas and okay. This thing got invented, which may not seem that cool to you, but if you've lived your whole life without ever seeing one, that's a pretty neat thing to have in school. It goes with your Lisa Frank notebook, you know. The DVD. 
it was actually invented in the 70s, but it came to its own in the 90s. People started buying DVD players. Again, the rich people could do it. Uh, the rest of us still watched our VHSs. Coffee culture. I don't know if y'all didn't know this, but coffee culture was not a thing in America in the like 60s, 70s, 80s. If you drank coffee, you drank coffee. And that was like old people got to McDonald's and they drank coffee with each other. And then this thing sort of happened where like bookstores, Barnes and Nobles, Books a Million started having little recliners and little seats where you could sit and actually drink coffee. And then it was like, well, let's make the coffee special. Let's put chocolate in it and let's put, you know, donuts in it or whatever else they put in it to make it taste more like a dessert than coffee. And suddenly this thing started happening and now it's taken over the world. These things got invented. They're pretty cool. And then the Humvee limo, that was a thing for a little while. The cell phone, which as you know, got invented before this, but it started becoming more accessible. I got my very first flip phone in the 90s. It was just for emergencies because those things were expensive. It's still at that point you were paying for long distance calls. So like if you called or text, there's no texting. If you call somebody out of the state, it was going to cost you a lot of money. So you just didn't do it. So it's basically like you had this phone in case you were on the side of the road dying. This came out. Um, have any of you ever read this book? Yes. Anybody watch the movie? Both of them. Phenomenal. Do both. I fell in love with this book as an adult. It was so good. Really, really good. She also wrote um, Number of the Stars about the Holocaust, Lois Lowry. She's an excellent writer. Read her book. Fabulous. This happened. Not necessarily so fabulous unless you really like watching people get in the head, hit in the head with bricks and things like that. But everybody went around doing that stupid thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Babe, if you haven't seen that, that's super adorable. Newsies, which I already recommended about the turn of the century. The Secret Garden. Read this one? Watched it? Everybody should. Everybody should. In fact, there's an old one from like the 30s, I think, that went all goth. And it actually deals with things like the victim mindset and whether or not you can make your own choices or whether you're just entitled. It's really, it actually hits some really deep stuff. Um, Hook came out. That story about the dogs that went looking for their owners. That was interesting. Sweet cry. This guy was in the news for a bit. These are magazine covers. And that wasn't all of them. Now, he is not in the politics category because he wasn't in politics. It was just scandal and money and power and stuff like that. Now, politics. Okay, so 1988 was when Bush won the election. So he was the vice president. Oh, man. He was the vice president to Reagan, if you remember. And he was the nice, quiet... Mike Pence kind of guy, really good sidekick, World War II hero. Um, so he won in 1988 against Dukakis. And he was known for the Disabilities Act, which I think is really neat. It's interesting, the people that were marching for the Disabilities Act used quotes. This is Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote. It said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I like that. I think that's neat. And then this one says, I can't even get to the back of the bus. So he was making the point that... You know, it's not just this minority group that's being overrun or overlooked or whatever you want to call it. So one of the reasons we have the handicapped places and the, you know, the railings and stuff we have now that they didn't have before is because of Bush. Good job. But other than that, Bush was kind of a quiet, unassuming sort of guy. He is basically known for three things, in my opinion, memory. Two things he said and one thing he did. First one. When he was campaigning at the, at the Republican convention, he said, read my lips, no new taxes. And then he got elected and guess what happened? He raised the taxes. So basically his respect went down just like everybody was done with him kind of in a sense. So don't make promises like that if you're not gonna be able to keep them. The other one is my favorite. It's about broccoli. <laughs> He said once about the plane, I do not like broccoli, and I haven't liked it since I was a little kid and my mother made me eat it. And I'm president of the United States and I'm not going to eat any more broccoli. That's funny. I don't like broccoli either. So I remember even when I heard this, I was like, that's hilarious. He's 65 years old. He should be able to say I don't need to eat broccoli anymore. But the thing that happened was mom, school lunches, schools everywhere. Ah, the president is promoting unhealthy, who knows what, blah, 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 right? There weren't memes back then, but if there had been memes, this would have been on all of them. I mean, the whole place just went up for So then he had to backtrack and be like, broccoli, really? God, boy, yeah, and all that kind of stuff. Poor guy. 
The big thing, though, that in my opinion made him a hero during the time that he was in office was Operation Desert Storm. Now, Daniel Spivey brought his poster project early about Desert Storm. He'd come up after class and bring these amazing pictures and facts so you can learn stuff that we don't have time to talk about. Thank you, Daniel. Um, this thing was another one of those moments that is like frozen in my head. So it's the late 90s. I was 17 years old. So junior, senior high school. And all of a sudden, my parents are in the room. There's something on TV. The news is on. And again, we're not watching 24-hour news. It was just like the news. But it was on at a weird time. And the only time that happened was when something really, really strange happened, and they interrupted the regular program to show you the news. And I go in the room, and there are bombs going off in Baghdad. And basically, the announcer is saying, we're at war. And here I am standing there, and it's this surreal moment because I'm thinking, does that mean all the guys I know are going to get called up? Is this like Vietnam all over again? Are we, you know, is the whole world going to change and all that kind of stuff? And what it, there was a lot of history to it. You can read that. But what Bush did, him being a military hero from way back, it was wow, wow. Basically, he was like, don't mess with us because we'll come after you. And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he did. And basically, they went in and just, they just bombed and bombed and bombed and bombed. And it was 42 days. But I believe it was only like three days that kind of like the American people, we were watching everything. Like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And after a while, boom, 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 they were like, okay, never mind. Now, that's an extremely simplified version of it. But it basically was like the best one, shortest, coolest war. Not cool, but. <laughs> so, um, it was either 82,000 or 88,000. Tons of bombs that were so basically, the U.S. was saying, um, we got the weapons, you really don't want to mess with us. And I appreciated that what he did wasn't like, we're going to kill all your people. It was like, don't mess with us. We don't want to do this. But if you do, we've got the stuff. So don't do it. So I really respected him for the way he handled that. All right. Next election, 92. Now, would Bush have won again? I think so. But he ran against this young guy named Bill Clinton, who was already a controversial because he was a draft dodger in the Vietnam War, and he was he was like a frat boy. So he was basically like this young urban professional who, you know, he was rich, he was cool, he, you know, played the saxophone, and he joked around with the guys, and he flirted a lot and stuff. I don't know. He was just, he was kind of more of what America's current thing was. Um, so he was running against Bush, who was the older, traditional, more Reagan, Republican, that kind of thing. Well, then there was this guy who showed up, um, who was like the chicken guy. <laughs> and he would get on and do these commercials, and he had this like enormous amount of confidence. He was so confident in himself. He would make these commercials, and you're like, who are you, and what are you doing, and why are you messing this up? But basically, he split a lot of the votes, and so Clinton won. Which, again, the place, you know, America seems to go back and forth about every eight, year, eight years, which we'll talk about next week. But anyway, so the Republicans lost, and he won, and obviously it wasn't a consensus. And then the scandals began. Um, well, actually, they began before he won, but yes, the draft dodging, this was him. I believe that was inauguration night, playing the saxophone. He would answer questions from press people about his underwear. He was just kind of like, I'm so cool. And his thing was, is the economy stupid? That was kind of like his campaign. Nothing like make America great. He was just like, money, y'all, don't be stupid. And the American public, that's kind of where they were too. The 90s were a very <laughs> greedy decade. It was basically like, you can have everything you want. Credit cards exist now. So you can go get all the cool clothes, whether you can afford them or not. You can get the cool job with the computers. You can get the success. You can have it all. More, 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 more. And he fit the American ideal at the time of the people who were kind of rising up in power, which was the young generation. Can I get some water? Just me. Then there was this, which was the scandal with Monica Lewinsky. He had an affair. He lied about it. It came out. All these people started sending in accusations, which to y'all is probably no big deal. That's pretty normal. A bunch of people making accusations about a bunch of stuff. At that time, it wasn't as huge. I mean, we had Nixon, but that was a political thing. Um, there were things before with other presidents, but it wasn't huge, major. Everybody's talking about it like a big soap opera. This was a huge nationwide stinking soap opera. Went to court. He literally looked America in the face and said, I did not. 
And then, of course, the courts dragged on and on and on, and they brought all this smeary, smutty stuff all over the place, and everybody's talking about it. I'm like, oh, so... And then, of course, it came out that, yes, he did. And so now we're back to, does it matter if your president is a lying, cheating guy without character if he is good for the economy? So that's what Americans were talking about at the time. That was the subject to talk about. Does that matter or not? You can talk about it. Uh, talk about it at home. Talk about it with your parents. Ask them what they thought about all this. I'll tell you honestly, um, I was overseas at the time. This was on the front page of the paper in the country where I lived. It was a Muslim country. And it pointed out that this guy called himself a Baptist. Christian. And where I lived, they talked about how their country was Muslim and this other country was Hindu and America was Christian. And so they thought all the stuff they got from America, including all the TV shows, that's what Christians acted like. So you remember how things are relative? If you ever talk for somebody overseas and they talk about Christians, how they would never want to be a Christian, don't think they're talking about Jesus Christ. <laughs> Ask them what they're talking about because they might be talking about this. Okay, moving on. So let's talk about belief systems. Remember I told you it was kind of this greedy, have it all, me, me, me kind of decade. I think it was even called the me generation. Um, and people didn't seem to mind. Yep, exactly. So there was this big wave of new spirituality. And the new age movement happened. And people thought it was new age. Like, ooh, this is a new thing. Okay, one of the things that happened was new age music. There was this guy named Yanni. He had big flowy hair and a mustache. And he thought he was really cool. And electric keyboards came out. And with that came the sound of synthesizers. You know, all these cool things you can do with a keyboard. Well, that was brand new. So everybody was doing all these cool things with the keyboard. So they got music with like sounds and, you know, really like ooh, yoga stuff. So he would make these songs that had all these interesting sounds that you could do while you're meditating and nature sounds and all these interesting things. And that was new age music. Then there were all the other new age things. So there were the crystals and, you know, the fortune telling got back into the thing. And that's when yoga became big and kind of incorporated coffee culture and just the whole thing. It just the whole thing. Interestingly, though, if you have studied history, which you have, you know, this is just recycled from the 70s. Remember the groovy people who were going to go be one with nature and be part of it all and all that kind of stuff? And that's just recycled from about 100 years ago with Henry Thoreau on Walden Pond, if you've ever read that, where he basically went out and lived in a tiny house and criticized all the people who were working because it's so much better to just know yourself. And that's just recycled from other stuff that goes all the way back to Hinduism, which is thousands of years old. So it's like super, super, super not new age. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. But it wasn't the only thing that changed. And I want to spend a couple minutes on this slide because one of the things I noticed about the 90s, and maybe it's happened before, but it seemed to me like Christianity decided to try to be cool. What that meant? Well, for one, we started having t-shirts with really cheesy sayings on them. Jesus, King of Kings, pump you up. Do you know the song Pump You Up? And there was a shirt that had a big high top on it. And it said, pump it up. For Jesus. Like, what does that even mean? That doesn't even mean anything. But it basically was like saying, I'm a Christian, but I wear t-shirts, so I'm still cool. I don't even know what we were trying, you know. Um, another thing was huge was I Kissed Saving Goodbye, which was a book by a guy who basically said it was like promoting courting, the courting idea. And it got to be a huge trend among the Christian culture. And it's not that that was a bad idea, but then he ended up recanting and something, 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 something. So it started this whole fad thing, and then it fizzled down like fads often do. And so then it just made the whole thing look kind of silly. Um, WWJ Day bracelets. Everybody was wearing those all over the place. Uh, it was good if it actually reminded you what would Jesus do. But if not, you know. I knew these friends who named their kid so that his initials were WWJ. <laughs> um, the Left Behind series. Huge phenomenon. Like millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of books sold. You will notice that movies and books that are extremely successful tend to play on either the things people want or the things people fear. So like Godzilla or like in the 50s, there's all these movies about the nuclear warfare and it's going to make all the, you know, the cockroaches turn 20 foot tall and all that kind of stuff because that's what people are scared of. Well, in the 90s, it was the millennium. And so a lot of people were like, maybe this is when the Lord's coming back because it's the year 2000 and the world's going to fall apart. And so these books about the end times and about the rapture were like, oh, huge hit. 
Then they started making movies about them. And it actually, it was a good thing. I think a lot of people came to Christ from reading them. But it was definitely a trend. And you can still buy them places if you want to read them. They're good books. They're well written. Uh, But again, it was a fad. This was another fad, the angels thing. There were a lot of fads in the 90s. And so you go in the Christian bookstore and there are angels everywhere. But the funny thing is, is, what does an angel look like? Well, the angels in the bookstores, they're like blonde with beautiful flowy 90s hair, thank you very much, and beautiful flowy dresses, and they look our definition of angelic. Where does that come from? Where in the Bible does it say anything about an angel like that? In the Bible, what does an angel usually have to say when it shows up? Fear not. (laughs) Why would that lady need to be there? Fear not, honey. No, it's like whatever this angel looks like, people are terrified. You know, it's God's army person, you know. But this was a show that was basically like this angel lady shows up and there's a problem. And she loves them and she helps them deal with their problem. And then at the very end, she starts glowing and she says, God loves you. And basically it was all about you are acceptable exactly as you are, honey. God loves you so much and you are just so spiritual and everything's going to be fine and God's going to fix your problems. Never once in that whole show that I know of did she mention salvation through Jesus Christ. So what it did was it took the Christian culture and the New Age culture and put them all in a show together and said, let's be happy together. So again, just because it's a fad and just because it makes people think that they're spiritual, check it with the scriptures. Critical thinking, y'all. I got but God does love you, just seeing that. Okay, the bad. There was a lot of bad in the 90s. Uh, the first school shooting in Columbine happened. It's devastating for the entire country. Um, that was just really bad. The Oklahoma City bombing happened. We assumed that was terrorism, and it turned out to be somebody in America. The Waco thing, which was a cult that the FBI tried to come in and fix. Things got hairy. There was a shootout. People died. That was bad as well. It was... It was a tough time inside our own culture. Slang. I put that in the bad category because I think 90s slang is some of the most annoying slang that ever came up with. I mean, applesauce, that's pretty cute from the 20s, you know? But, like, talk to the hand thing? (laughs) Or, like, that was so much fun. Not. It's almost like you have to roll your eyes when you say it, you know? Like, (laughs) as if, y'all, really. (laughs) Okay. So, like, don't be like 90s. But the you-go girl, that did come from and you're all that in a bag of chips, so you can say that from that one's okay. All right, the good. <laughs> there was a commercial, had this little chihuahua, and he'd be like, you quiero Taco Bell. So we all went around saying that. Okay. This guy, the goat, before there was such a thing as a goat, if you've ever seen him play, wow. The Magic School Bus. I didn't know it was this new. This was started, it was really cool. They wanted to have girls and minorities get more into science. I absolutely love the Magic School Bus. This book. Write it down. If you haven't read it or circle it on your thing or something like that. We listened to it on audio a few years ago. And it's really, really, really good. It's like this philosophical metaphor. It's got these little mice and their cheese. But it talks about entitlement, victimization, purposeful choosing about your future, all that kind of stuff. Really good. And it's short, so it won't take that long. This happens. So email arrived. The internet. AOL, when it first started... Y'all just do not know. You would hook it up to your phone thing and it'd go. <laughs> yeah, and this guy kept going. Go. Oh, man. The stuff we put up with just to have email. Um, I was in college when I remember hearing about electronic mail for the first time. And I remember kind of being like, well, that sounds interesting, but I got a project I got to work on. So I didn't even bother to ask questions about it. It was supposed to save us a lot of time because it takes so much time to write personal letters. So if you could send it like this, that's gonna be so much faster and you'll have so much more free time. How many of you have more free time because of email? <laughs> yeah, no. So now we just email everybody on the planet and now we have less time. Ben Carson, I don't know if you know this about him. His story completely is phenomenal, even as he was a little kid. His mom wouldn't let him watch TV until he'd read two books from the library and she couldn't really read. And he didn't know that. It was phenomenal. He grew up to be a genius. He and 70 people, he led these 70 people as a brain surgeon to successfully separate twins who were joined at the back of the head. This was astonishingly revolutionary. The man is a genius, and he seems to have a really big heart as well. He's a cool guy to study. Okay, the weird is like the biggest ever for this decade. 
just because I had fun. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is weird in and of itself, but in New Zealand, it was actually banned because it was too violent. <laughs> Which is really funny. I'm the Power Ranger. Yeah. Okay. This thing, okay. Just so y'all know, nothing new under the sun. These things were called Furbies. They were from China. Okay. In 1999, you got to hear this. More than 2 million kids had one of these, and they talked. The NSA, they decided it was an international threat, and they banned people from carrying them around because they were trying to prevent the Chinese government from installing secret listening devices into them so they could hear our secrets and stuff. Okay, y'all remember the when everybody's going around taking pictures and everybody's like, they're getting all the info. Remember TikTok? China's getting all our info. Not new. It was the Burbies first. Which they do kind of look a little bit like those gremlins, which was another like horror movie for children. That they started out cute and then they turned like super creepy and scared us all to death. That was the 80s. Oh, this happened. Da, 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 da. I don't even know how to do it. I don't know why it became famous, but when I came home from overseas, everybody in the world seemed to be doing this. It's like super catchy song with no real words. I can do it, girl. I don't know how. Yeah. Okay, this one's funny. Jurassic Park. Okay, big, huge, awesome, whatever. The roar from the dinosaur that's scary. <laughs> they got that roar from recording of their dog playing with a rope. They just slowed it down. <laughs> Ooh. I'm scared of the dog with the rope. The Vidalia onion became Georgia's official state vegetable. <laughs> Random fact. Beanie babies. Why? You know? So next day, next time your culture gets all hooked up on something and whatever, maybe just wait it out a little bit. When Y2K, of course. Now the thing with Y2K was that all the computers were made not all of them, whatever, long story technology. They had this little 99 on them for the year, and they were kind of worried when it flipped over to 2000, it goes to zero, zero. And does that mean they're all going to glitch because they're not computed, programmed, whatever you want to call it, for that? And does that mean they're all going to shut down? Well, by this point, of course, the world is digital. The airplane flights and the grocery stores, remember the barcode, you know, there's all this stuff that's running on computer information. So there really was a genuine threat that if everything shut down, we're like in a dystopian novel and... What are we gonna do? We can't even get groceries. And you would think that everybody would be reasonable about it, but considering the toilet paper thing a couple years ago, we know that people aren't reasonable. So it was what people were talking about. People were stockpiling for it. People were prepping. It was a big deal. And I was in a third world country when the millennium actually happened. And we got the millennium 11 hours before y'all did. And it was really funny because it's like, so here's the millennium. And it happened. And I was like, well, if the computers in the third world country didn't go kaput, I think you guys are okay. <laughs> but it was interesting because out in the streets, they were out there celebrating. And sometimes when they celebrated, they would like shoot, shoot into the air or like put off like a little homing bombs and stuff. And we were standing up on the fifth floor roof because the, roo the roofs were flat. And we were taking pictures. We were like, the millennium, the millennium. You know, it's a once in a lifetime moment in history. And then I felt this bullet go whizzing past me. And I was like, let's celebrate inside. Can you imagine how embarrassing you'd be like, who shot you? Somebody partying? You know. <laughs> okay, so then 2000 did actually happen. Y2K didn't happen. We're all still here, and we're not eating green beans in a can. Um, one last thought. The big phrase of the decade was just do it. Thank you, Michael Jordan and Nike. But the funny thing is about the 90s, this, was, this kind of represented the 90s. Just do it. Just do it. But just do what? Like, seriously, just do what? That was kind of the problem of the 90s was that there wasn't a lot of discernment. It was just like, just do it. Go for it. Make the money. Get the job. Get, you know, be popular. Be whatever. Spend the credit card money. That would be great. Buy the beanie babies. <laughs> just do it. Just do it. And any time in history that that happens, it's a good idea to back up a little bit and ask a couple questions. Just do what? Why are we just doing this? What does this even mean? Where did I put my notebook? <laughs> okay, so, lack of organizational skills. All right, so I really wanted to finish early so that we could talk about something. I know what it was, flip your papers over. <laughs> Just do it, that's what I should have written down. Just find your notebook. All right. So we have our nine lessons from history that we went over a few weeks ago. You've got a pencil or a pen. Let's go ahead and see how many of these you remember that we can fill in. 
So, number one. Blank and blind, come and go. Oh, wait, number one, there's always something to blank about. Do you know what that is? Yes. Panic. panic. There's always something to panic about. Blank, okay. Ah! There's always something to panic about. If you know the Lord, you don't need to panic. You've got it. Number two, blank and blind, come and go, and are often ridiculous. Oh. Fads and ideals. So the fads is easy to remember. You can see the big bouffant hairdos and stuff, and you're like, well, that's silly. But remember, ideals are the same way. Ideals are fads, just like clothing. They're just hard to spot sometimes. Number three, blank reveals who people really are. Crisis. Crisis, yes. So when things fall apart, if y 2 they did happen, we find out what the American people were made of. Number four, blank shouldn't surprise us because we live in a blank world. Now one is a little harder, didn't you? Close. Think of the politician. Yeah. Close. Ooh, I might get you on this one. Corruption. Corruption. So it's the same as sin, but particularly when you're thinking about politics and stuff, expect people to be corrupt. Expect to see corruption. Because we live in a sinful, thank you, Daniel, world. That's just the way it is. And no matter what politician you vote for or how much you get the politics to be the way you want, the world is still going to be sinful. Number five, blank and blank are always with us. That sounds kind of creepy. The Furbies and the gremlins in China. Um, <laughs> injustice and oppression are always with us. Just like Jesus said, the poor are always with us. We're not going to fix world poverty. We're not going to change everything so that everything's all good because we live in a sinful world. So you do what God tells you to do, and you leave the rest to him. Number six, there will always be blank, blank about something. Ooh, that's a good one. That was kind of like the whole, well, if you want to be cool, you have to have name brands. And if you want to be cool, you have to be the same political party as me. And if you want to be whatever, what's that called? When your little yeah, flick says, I'm not going to be your friend if you don't have my shoes. Like, what, really? Yes, peer pressure. There will always be peer pressure about something. And the thing to remember is, it's not just when you're a kid. You grow up and you get peer pressure about other things. Where you live, what you do, how you vote, where you go to church, what kind of music you listen to. Just skip all that and do what God wants you to do. History is always taught with what? Bias. Bias, yes. I'm teaching history with bias. There's no question about that. I'm trying to be honest about it, but it's definitely with bias. If I was a Norwegian, I'd be teaching different history. If I was a Norwegian, I'd be confused because I don't know what their history is. Number eight, there is blank new under the sun. Yes, nothing. nothing. Good job, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. God said that a long time ago, and it's still true. We just keep recycling things. And number nine, blank is always active in history. That's true. Who else? God, yes. So <laughs> that pretty much is history right there, what the two of you just said. God is always active in history. We'll be talking about that the very last week, closing things up, so that you can be encouraged and you don't have to panic about the next Y2K. Now, your assignment this week, should you choose to accept it, take a look back at the front of your worksheet. Basically, you're going to look at these nine lessons. I want to know, write down things you can think of in our present culture right now that fit these categories. For example, there's always peer pressure about something. What's something our culture right now peer pressures us about? Wearing masks. Okay, wearing masks. Vaccine, vaccine. Vaccines. What else? Like even ideal. Jumping off the <laughs> Okay, yes, super mega tolerance. Um, so, yeah, there's peer pressure in our culture right now, and being able to recognize what those things are helps you to be above it, not sucked into the middle of it, and especially not to feel like your worth is in the middle of it. So I would like to know what you have to say. You can talk to your parents. It's a great, interesting conversation topic. If you're doing more interviews, you can ask them. So what was peer pressure back when you were a teenager? And you might find out the weirdest things, and you'll be like, wow, I would never give into that. But then again, they're probably looking at some of our things and being like, wow, that's really dumb. I would never give in to that. So if you wish, we're running out of weeks, especially for making points. 
So if you'll take a look up here next week, y'all, we are going on a deep dive into politics next week. Dig into politics. Prepare to be shocked. I was shocked. Y'all asked a question way in the back, and I said I'd find out, and I had to do some heat research, and whoa! So we're going there. We're going to find out about the history of the two different parties, the animals, the colors, the stuff. Wow. The week after that, November 16th, two weeks from today, is our epic review game. Epic review game. Plan to be here. Plan to be smart. Bring your worksheets. So if you've saved your worksheets all this time, bring every single one of them. You're going to want to have them. It's also the day your posters are due if you want to get points for them. So bring your posters in in two weeks. Then there's Thanksgiving. And then the next day is our essay poster and prize essay. So we're going to have some people reading some essays. We're going to have some people presenting posters. We're going to give the points, the final points. We're going to give all the prizes, of which there are excessively many. And then the week after that, we're going to be talking about God and history, and then we're done. You may, for the next two weeks, until the, this is our last, this is our last day for points. So up until this point, you may in keep interviewing as many people as you'd like to interview. You will keep getting points for as many as you do. And also work on your poster. And does anybody have any questions about any of that? Yes. Do we not come? Correct. Thanksgiving, there is no fellowship. See you later. Just do it, but do like something good.